Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our virtual nature talk about birds. I'm so glad you could join us today. Before we get started with Alan and Patsy Kuntz, I wanted to tell you a little about the Phil Hardberger Park Conservancy. So one moment here, I just wanna make sure everyone is admitted. The Conservancy is a member-based nonprofit that bridges the gap between San Antonio and nature by bringing free nature programs to the public. They also protect the natural habitat of the park through advocacy, fundraising, and promotion. If you enjoy the programs that we offer in the park, please consider supporting the Conservancy through a donation or becoming a member. Visit philhardbergerpark.org to learn more. This talk will be recorded and shared on our website, so please turn off your video and mute your microphone. This helps reduce background noise. If you have any questions during this presentation, volume. please post them in the chat, and Patsy and Alan will be happy to address them at the end of the talk. One more thing. Um, after this presentation at the Northwest military side of Hardberger Park, we will be handing out some take home activity bags for elementary students focused on birds. So that's a way to um, enrich your experience learning about birds this Saturday. So, okay, Patsy and Alan Kuntz are here today to talk to us about birds. So Patsy and Alan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Catherine. And, uh, Welcome everybody to our virtual nature walk, uh, 60 plus people, that's more than we can handle on a regular walk. So I'm glad to see so many folks here. Uh, first, a little about us uh, and birding in Phil Harburger Park. Before the park even opened, uh, Patsy and I joined in a monthly uh, birding survey led by uh, Georgina Schwartz uh, and those, and we're still doing that every month. Uh, I was then instrumental in uh, establishing a bird water feature on the uh, Blanco side in 2015. More recently, Patsy and a small group of folks have established the Alamo area master naturalist wildscape demonstration garden on the uh, Northwest military side. We've also been leading an annual Oak Loop Trail bird walk since at least 2013. So we're in the park a lot and usually with binoculars. We try, we try to gear our monthly bird walks toward people who may be new to birding and today will be no different. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about birding tools, binoculars, uh, birding identification aids and something called eBird. I'll then turn it over to Patsy for the main event which will be the photographs and information about uh, the birds of Phil Hardberger Park. First, just a little housekeeping. We will reference a bunch of resources today uh, and all of them will be available in a PDF document that you will be able to get from Phil Hardberger Park Conservancy website in a few days. One of these resources is a link to uh, the bird list that uh, we've put together birds through the eBird program. Okay. Uh, I want to first talk a little bit about binoculars. Uh, they are key to a, a good birding experience. Uh, binoculars for birding need to be able to allow you to find the bird and focus on it quickly. Uh, Patsy and Tom Inglet, two local birders that many of you probably know, uh, have put together an excellent guide to selecting uh, binoculars specifically for birding. We have a link to that. Uh, uh, on uh, the document that uh, uh, it'll, be re it'll be included in our resources document. Now, uh, binoculars need to be a properly adjusted uh, rather than spending time showing you how to do this. Uh, we've included in our reference document an excellent article in the Outdoor Life magazine that mm -hmm. tells how to uh, adjust binoculars. Finally, binoculars are useful only if you can find the bird. And the way you get on the bird, as we say, is first you look up and see what you see where you think the bird is or see the bird. 
Then keep your eyes on that bird, bring the binoculars up to your eyes and the bird will be there. Unless of course he's flown. Uh, if you try to bring him up to your eyes and then find the bird, it's, it's just about impossible. Uh, the next topic is uh, ID AIDS. Uh, everybody needs to, every birder needs to have some uh, way of identifying birds in the field. There are many field guides available in app form, in uh, book form. I have several. I, uh, I started using the uh, Sibley when I got to Texas and found that my trusty Peterson guide uh, to Eastern birds did not include uh, all of the South Texas specialties. Now, as far as books are concerned, there's no one best choice. It's really uh, an individual thing because different folks like different things. So I, my only advice as far as book selection is uh, to look at the books that other birders you meet uh, are using and get their input. Now, I mostly use apps now but I find a, a book very useful uh, on walks for a couple of things. When I'm sharing, when I'm sharing a picture with people, it's a lot easier to use a book than it is to uh, try to show it on a oh. on a uh, there I am. on a uh, phone. Uh, and also, if you've got several birds that you're trying to look at. It's sometimes easier to flip between pages in a book than it is on an app, although some apps do that better than others. Uh, uh, like apps, like books, are a personal thing, but I, I will make two recommendations here uh, for two apps that are both good and free. One of them is the uh, National Audubon Society, offering cleverly named the Audubon Bird Guide app. And that is excellent. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology provides a free app called Merlin that many people also use. If you want additional features, again, like for, for books, I suggest you talk to folks and look at, uh, at their apps. Uh, both those apps that I mentioned are on the, the resources page. The next thing I want to talk about is eBird. And to do that, I'm going to start a little slideshow here. Uh, eBird is a, is a worldwide database that is the result of folks like you and me uh, submitting checklists. Uh, and so there's two aspects of that that I want to talk about today. One is submitting, uh, and the other is using the results of everybody else's stuff. And you get started by going to eBird, signing up. It's easy, it's free. And that app also has some excellent, uh, has an excellent help section that you can find out uh, most of what you need to know. Hmm. Uh, so, you can submit data by either uh, going to the website or using a free app. Uh, to go to the website, you just collect the data in the normal manner on, on paper. And then when you get back to your, your computer, you can enter the number of, the number of each bird that you uh, see. Uh, I actually prefer the app. I think it's, it's easier to use now that I've, I'm used to it than uh, trying to keep a list uh, a list on paper. Uh, the app is available uh, for both Apple and, uh, and Android. Uh, and once you've got it on the submitted by either method, you can go to those checklists and this shows one and you can do things like added pictures or share it with other people or send yourself a copy. Uh, you, you've got information about your checklist there. Now, obviously, since a lot of different people are submitting data, uh, uh, data quality could be an issue. The way, the way uh, eBird handles that 
is by local experts that uh, monitor uh, monitor the submissions for rare or unusual sightings. Uh, I was in Phoenix once and I accidentally entered black chinned <laughs> instead of black throated sparrow. And I got this nice email suggesting that that would be a very uncommon uh, sighting in, uh, especially in a residential area. So I changed it and all was better. Uh, once you started entering, entering uh, data, then it, it organizes it for you by by state, uh, county, uh, time, year, month, whatever. And, and you can access every checklist that you've ever submitted in case you want to take a little stroll down, down memory lane. So that's how you submit data now with, with hundred, over 100 million bird sightings submitted. There's a lot of information out there. I use, I use three uh, uh, four things uh, provided by eBird. One is birding hotspots. Those are areas designated as good birding spots. And so when I go to a new place, I pull up hotspots for that area so I can find the good spots to go birding. This is an example of the San Antonio area with the red spot being, uh, being Mitchell Lake with well over 300 birds sighted and a lot of other uh, good birding spots here. The next thing I use once I decide where I'm going to want a bird would be the would be the bar chart, and this basically just tells me where what I might see at a particular time. This is for uh, Phil Hardberger Park, and as you can see, at this time of year, you might expect to see doves, maybe a roadrunner, but probably not probably not a chimney swift. Definitely not a chimney swift. The other thing that I use is the species map. If I cite something and I think I know what it is, but I'm a little dubious about submitting it. Uh, if I look on the species map, I can see if it's been seen recently. The red uh, locations are where the Rufus hummingbird, for instance, has been seen within the last month. And then it's been seen in a lot of other places over time. So if I see a Rufus hummingbird now, I can feel pretty good that, yeah, that's probably it. And if it's not on here, then I can say, wow, I've got a rare bird. That's good. Uh, the final thing I use eBird for is a rare bird alert. Uh, this is an email that goes out when there are rare birds in the area. This particular eBird alert is for the first and so far only yellow-throated uh, warbler seen in uh, Phil Hardberger Park. And from here, you this email tells you, gives you a map showing where it is, North, North Harbor, uh, Hardberger Park. And then it, you can access the actual checklist. And once you uh, access the checklist, uh, you can see that most of the birds on this checklist were at the bird water feature, but one of them, the yellow-throated warbler, was seen in the trees toward the parking lot from the bird water feature. So uh, this feature allows you to go find some birds that uh, you might not, you probably not see unless you were notified of them. Uh, that concludes my part of the program. And I'm going to now turn it over to Patsy for, for uh, photographs and more information. Thank you. Well, thanks, Alan. Um, now we're going to move to what I call the birdie part of the program. Um, if you're new to birding, um, a real key to getting started is your observation skills. Uh, you'll probably quickly find that watching for movement is a good way to spot a bird. Uh, and then after you see something like that, a bird, you want to start noticing characteristics of the birds that you do, do see, such as how large the bird is, how it's shaped, what its habits are, in other words, what's it doing, what color is it, and what patterns does it have on it. Now, a lot of people go to color first 
when they're trying to identify birds and color is important, but all these other aspects of the bird are important too. Um, and sometimes really, if you're a really new birder, it's best to start talking about birds in terms of where you might see them. So I'm going to begin this part of the program thinking about birds that will be um, flying overhead. And let me screen share. And so we're talking about birds. We talk about birds overhead, as I said, and um, this is a group of sandhill cranes flying high overhead uh, during migration. Now, see if you can make that picture as big as you can, and it's you're quick to see, say, what? how in the world would I ever tell what they are? But this is a good example of why you need binoculars because our eyes just can't take it all in from that distance. Um, I will tell you that these, you can kind of see that these have, these are birds with a long neck. They're flying left to right. On the left, you see a long neck and the head. I mean, on the right, you see the long neck and the head. And on the left, you can see their tail and you can actually see their legs out behind them. During migration, we sometimes see groups of well over a hundred sandhill cranes flying together right here at Hardburger Park. And um, several years ago, I saw a, a group that I think was probably bigger than that uh, going over Eisenhower Park. And if you, you, you really can't get a good idea of what this bird looks like from that distance, but I did recently get a picture closer up of a sandhill crane and, and I'm putting this in so you have some idea of what they look like up close. I took this picture just last week, just this, this week actually, in the hill country while passing a cattle feedlot between Willow City and Highway 281. I've never seen sandhill cranes in a cattle feedlot, but, and, and there's no book that's going to tell you that's where you're going to find them. But the truth of it is, uh, as birders often say, they have wings and they can fly where they want to. And they also don't, don't read the books about where they're supposed to be. So you may think, that you're gonna find them in the place that are in the books, but not always. Here's a group of white pelicans flying over. Now they were a little bit lower, so we're able to see them better with my uh, a little telescoping on my uh, camera lens. Um, we don't have any documented sightings of white pelicans flying over Hardburger yet, but they do often fly over other natural areas in San Antonio. Um, they're all white birds except for the black on the trailing edge of the wings. And the only bird, uh, other bird that can be confused with that overhead uh, might be wood storks. And believe it or not, they are, wood storks are occasionally seen in San, the San Antonio area, but the storks have a dark neck and head instead of the bright white neck and uh, head of the pelicans. And actually uh, the only wood stork I have seen here in San Antonio was a lone bird. It was not flying with other um, wood storks. It actually was flying with some vultures, believe it or not. And here's a great tailed grackle. Um, it often flies in raucous groups of a hundred or more uh, that gather at night uh, to roost uh, in the trees at big parking lots, um, similar to the kind that HEB has. And some people have started calling these the HEB birds. They don't know what they are. They are great tailed grackles, but they become the HEB birds when you see them at HEBs many times on. Um, they also forage on pastures and lawns in great groups. The males, and this is a male, are black with a long tail. You can see how long that tail is off on the bottom left. And um, the females though are dark brown with a buff colored throat and a noticeably shorter tail than the males. And because uh, in this species, the sexes look so different, observers often think that they are two different kinds of species, uh, but they're not. So in the morning, if you're close to a place where a pack of these birds have roosted overnight, you might well see them flying off all together in the sky in the, those same large groups that sat down there last night to roost. 
cedar wax wings. And these are eating mistletoe berries. It was the first time I had seen them eating mistletoe. I've seen them eat other things, but uh, I know that they eat a lot of mistletoe. I just hadn't seen it myself. Um, they often eat berries and hackberry trees uh, and other kinds of, many other kinds of berries too. Um, we see cedar waxwings here in San Antonio mostly in the winter as they breed in the spring and summer in the northern half of the U.S. as well as uh, uh, well into Canada. Uh, they have an easily recognized, very high-pitched noise. It, it kind of goes, <laughs> very high-pitched, higher than that. Um, and people who have some hearing impairment in those higher um, pitches aren't able to hear them. Um, but some people call that sound that they make a sighing whistle. Um, they often call as they fly. And sometimes if your hearing is still really good in those higher pitches, you'll be able to hear them coming and start looking around. And sure enough, there'll be a group of cedar waxwings. Um, they are almost always in a group. It's not very often that you see a single cedar wax wing. So if you see one, there's probably going to be a bunch more with them. And the, I'll, I'll make a note that this winter, we seem to have kind of an incredible uh, number of cedar wax wings, many, many more than usual in a winter here. Um, and um, well, they eat the berries off the ligustrum trees and those berries are purple. So when they go through the cedar waxwing and come out the other end, they leave quite a mess. And so I've seen a lot of oh, social media on next door and that sort of thing talking about how can I get rid of these big purple splats on my driveway, my deck, my front porch. So people are getting kind of irritated with them if they want to run a tidy household. Okay, um, onward. Black vultures, we have a couple of different kinds of vultures here. Um, this happens to be a group of black vultures. Once again, without binoculars, it's kind of hard to see what they are. But I'm going to show you a few more vulture photos here. Here's a black vulture. Um, I, I took this photo near the Oakmont along the savannah uh, just a couple of months ago. And this, uh, this black vulture was working on a carcass, carcass of a deer, right? Oh, maybe 20 feet off the pathway. Uh, the two vulture species that we see here are the black vulture and the turkey vulture. Um, and if you look at them sitting on the ground, so close up, the difference is that the head of this black vulture is a dark gray, whereas the head of the turkey vulture is kind of a bright red. Uh, they're both about the same length, uh, both of them about two feet long. So it's a good, it's a good sized bird. Um, and when you see them in flight in the sky, if they're close enough down or if you can get your binox on them, uh, you'll see a, a big difference too. In flight, the black vulture has a silvery, has silvery slash white patches near the tip ends of the wings. And, um, and the turkey vulture has uh, white on the trailing edge of the wings. Now I'm gonna show you a picture of that. So here's a black vulture soaring with the white tips on the wings. The white you're seeing there on under the tail, I think, is a reflection of the legs. And a turkey vulture soaring. You're going to see uh, white not only on the tips, but along the trailing edge of those wings. And that is a really good indicator uh, for which bird you're looking at. There are some other subtle indicators, too. Um, and you can get to know that once you get this part uh, known. Um, they're also often seen, uh, both species actually, are often seen soaring or roosting in mixed groups. Uh, uh, near Hardberger Park, we often see vultures roosting atop the high overhead lights along Wurzbach Parkway, especially in the morning. And uh, yeah, we do see turkey vultures here, as I say, but I'd say at Hardberger, the vulture that we see the most of is the black vulture. Now, I've talked a lot about vultures and you know, some might say, what is that lady talking about vultures so much for? What's so special about vultures? Well, they are our cleanup crew. Um, they eat dead animals, often roadkill, um, animals on farms and various places. Uh, and, and it prevents those dead animals from remaining in, in place long enough to rot 
and potentially sp cause disease spread. And as we all know, disease pr prevention is an important factor for all of us. Just think of all the dead stuff that would be around if we didn't have our vultures to clean it up. And here's another bird that you might see flying high. In this case, I've got two of them here. Uh, they were displaying some um, mating behavior uh, at, down at Asikia Park here in San Antonio. Um, uh, the bottom one is looking the other direction, uh, but the top one um, is pretty visible there. And um, crested caracara are often uh, called Mexican eagles by people in San Antonio and in basically South Texas. They are not um, technically, um, that's technically not their name, but we hear it often. And you might see them flying overhead at Hardburger Park. Usually it's gonna be one or two at a time. But until 30 years ago, you had to go down into the valley in southern, far Southern Texas to see one. But their range has been moving steadily to the north for some time now. And um, we, last year we had, we saw uh, several juvenile crested caracara in the park. So it's likely that they're nesting at Hardburger Park. Um, when seen from below, uh, it looks as if, if you look, look under that tail, it looks white. If you look under that neck, it looks um, white. If you see them from below, it looks like they have a white head and a white tail. And they're sometimes mistaken as uh, taken for bald eagles. Uh, but bald eagles aren't typically found here, even though their range is increasing and someday they might come here. Um, they, it's a very unusual, very, very unusual sighting to get a bald eagle in Bayer County. Um, the Caracara also has, as it's flying, white on the tips of its wings. So we, we say that all four corners of the Cara, crested Caracara are white. And just like vultures, the Caracara eat carrion or dead animals. And uh, sometimes you'll come across a crested Caracara in a, a, a mixed among a group of vultures on the ground eating carrion. And, but car crested Caracaras eat live animals too. Uh, the first time I saw one was when Alan and I were driving down in the valley in far South Texas, some 30 plus <laughs> years ago. And we saw a crested Caracara right off the side of the road in the roadside ditch. And it was, it was fighting a big snake. He was trying to catch this big snake. And I mean, it was, you know, it was a big snake. It took quite a while because that snake probably weighed quite a bit more than the Caracara. But in the end, the Caracara won the battle and uh, had quite a time of it carrying that big snake off to a place that was farther away from the road. And by the way, if you ever come across something like that, try not to get close. Try to stay back, way back so that you don't disrupt animal life. Birds, birds gotta eat, everybody's gotta eat. And um, just let them alone and do what they need to do. Red-shouldered hawks, we see them in the sky. We also obviously see them on, on pools, on posts. Uh, this picture was taken at the Wildscape Demonstration Garden. Um, it has red shoulders, the red shoulder, I'm gonna circle it a little bit. The red shoulders are right here. Sometimes they're a little more uh, subtle, more difficult to see, uh, but that is uh, uh, one of the better field marks as well as they have a black and white striped tail. A couple of years ago, a pair of them mated uh, over close to the old stone loker residence and on the uh, other side of the park, the Blanco entrance side of the park. And um, as we work in the, in the demonstration garden, we often see a red-shouldered hawk come around. And um, I think he's checking, he or she is checking to see what tasty morsels we might turn up as we move around in the garden. Um, now take a look too at the, at the length of the tail on this bird. This is an important indicator. It's long, but not real long. And that's going to be one of the ways we tell the difference between that and a Cooper's hawk, which is also is, is the other fairly common bird in the park. They're both year round in, in San Antonio and they hunt in the same kind of areas. So they probably have similar diets, except that the Cooper's hawk actually eats live birds more often, um, smaller birds. Uh, the red-shouldered hawk usually goes for something that's already um, 
already dead. And, uh, and the Coopers actually goes for, for live birds and chases them through the trees. They bo also both, if <laughs> they also both hunt around bird feeders. So that can be a problem in our neighborhoods. Uh, we've had that problem at our bird feeder system. Um, but everybody's got to eat. So that's another story. That's a whole nother program, what to do. Um, so they're about the same length, the Coopers and the red shoulders, uh, about, about 17 inches long. But the Cooper's hawk has a much narrower and longer tail than the red shoulder hawk. So this is a juvenile and the striping is gonna change on that breast as it ages. But take a look, take a look at that tail. It's, that is a really long tail. Um, so that's a key indicator too. Um, now I'm gonna move on to birds that are most often going to be see, seen in them. Um, in the trees, in the tree canopy, uh, sometimes at the top, sometimes in the middle, sometimes at the bottom. But there are a lot of birds that hang out in the trees more than in the sky. We're more likely to see them in the trees. This is an American kestrel. And it's, um, it's all puffed up. It's a very cold morning. I think it was in January of this year. I took this picture when we were on the um, monthly bird survey on the uh, Northwest Military Entrance side of the park in the savanna. Um, this is this, this kestrel is the smallest falcon in North America. It's about the size of a cardinal. Um, but you're, and you're most likely to see them um, high on top of a tree like this or on a wire along a roadside. Um, you know, one time in the winter, Alan and I took a trip to Aransas National Wildlife Refuge on the Texas coast, and it was amazing there were hundreds of American kestrels wintering there. And so we went for miles and saw kestrels on the tops of fence posts near fields, pretty much evenly spaced every quarter of a mile or so. They eat insects and rodents as well as small birds and small snakes. Um, and as with so many birds, uh, they are decreasing in number because of uh, the clearing of land uh, continues and that land clears the dead trees in which they nest in cavities. Um, plus many of the food types that they like are being killed off by pesticides. Here's a barred owl. Barred owls are with us year round, but we usually notice them early in winter when they call, especially in the night looking for a mate. They, they're grav they have a gravelly sound, a gravelly call, and it sounds like, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And normally I would try to imitate that, that sound, um, but it's too early in the morning and my mouth doesn't go the right way today. So, but it is a, it is a fun call to learn and practice. Um, not during the mating season, you don't want to disturb them from mating, but sometimes if you call, they will come and see what you, who is that? What is that? Is there another, if it's good enough, if it's a good enough imitation, they'll think there's maybe another owl in their territory. Don't do it when they're mating though. They need to spend all their energy on mating. Um, so they're pretty well camouflaged in the trees as you can see there in the tree canopy and you can pass right by them and never even know it. It's a good sized owl, 17 to 20 inches long, uh, slightly smaller than the other owl that we typically see here, which is the great horned owl. And I'm gonna talk about that next. The barred owls are mottled brown and white with dark eyes and dark eyes is a key feature here. They eat smaller birds and smaller animals of all kinds. And you gotta be careful if you've got a small dog because they will, or I mean a really small dog, uh, but they will try to take a small dog. And here is a great horned owl in a nest along Salado Creek. Uh, and this is, this is the parent and this is the baby, the fuzzy baby. So this, I, I love this shot. Um, this was maybe eight or 10, eight or nine years ago along Salado Creek. Uh, the nest has, uh, I believe, since fallen. Um, uh, great horned owls um, has these ear tufts. And although you can't see it on the adult, you can see it on the baby. Um, it has these yellow piercing eyes. And great horned owls eat um, frogs and mice, as well as uh, animals sometimes larger than it is itself. It's very aggressive and it's been known to kill and dismember 
barred owls that are only slightly smaller than the great horns. Um, they have a deep call too that's um, different, slightly different uh, from the barred owl. It goes and they usually hunt uh, for prey at night. Sometimes they'll do it during the daytime too in the winter. They eat all kinds of mammals and birds as well as insects and snakes. They usually come down on their prey from a perch, but will sometimes land and stalk their prey in the ground. And as I was doing the research for this program, I, I realized, I found, that I, I knew that most owls nest in a cavity in a tree and these do too, but sometimes they will nest. I, I knew they nested, uh, built a nest outside of a, cap, a tree cavity. And um, that's what they've got here, this nest outside of a tree cavity, but they do uh, nest in cavities too, tree cavities. Eastern Phoebe, uh, one of our quite regular visitors at Hardberger Park and actually in many parts of San Antonio is the Eastern Phoebe. It's our area's most common bird from the flycatcher category. We have Eastern Phoebes with us all year round. A distinctive behavior of the Eastern Phoebe is that it often lights sits down someplace and then bobs its tail. So if you see a, a, tail, a bird that looks like this and bobs its tail, probably gonna be an Eastern Phoebe. They nest in the wild, but they also nest in uh, neighborhoods. They uh, seem to have adapted well to human beings being around. And in fact, uh, there's a, um, when we had a Phoebe nest, Phoebe pair nesting high in our neighbor's front porch for several years, the parent birds would come over and follow Alan around in our yard as he mowed, apparently hoping that he was going to turn up some tasty morsels. And I did a couple of times see a, a butterfly, moth, whatever, fly out of the grass as he mowed. And, and that uh, Eastern Phoebe was right on top of it. Northern Cardinal. A lot of people here in San Antonio call this a red bird. I grew up here and I grew up calling it a red bird but it is called officially a Northern Cardinal. This is a male, the male is the brighter red, bright red. Um, this bird actually gives us joy here in San Antonio all year round. It's a seed eater and it's, most, it's often the first bird and last bird of the day at backyard bird feeders. The males are a brilliant red um, and even the most mostly brown females sport that crest on their head. Now it's a little hard to see in this picture. You can just barely see the tip of it. Sometimes that crest is up higher and sometimes they push it back a little bit like that. But this is one of our crested birds in San Antonio. Um, the Northern Cardinal ranges from the central US over into a bit of Arizona and then east to the Eastern United States. And here's a female Northern Cardinal. You can see how much duller she is, although she does have some red accents. And she was bathing at the bird water feature um, something I want to note is that water is not only for drinking, but it's also for taking baths for birds too. And uh, birds really have to have a bath periodically to clean their wings of dust particles. Um, any added weight that they carry in their wing on, on their wings uh, might affect their ability to fly swiftly from, uh, to get away from predators. Here's a blue jay, strikingly colored blue, white, and black bird. And when I was a kid here in San Antonio in the 1950s and 60s, we did not have blue jays here. Uh, they were mostly, you had to go to Houston and beyond to be able to find them. But in the ensuing years, uh, the range for these birds has expanded substantially to the west. And obviously they've been here for a long time now. They often, uh, they're very aggressive with predators and they often gang up on owls and hawks uh, that might come into what they consider to be their area. So if you hear a big ruckus up in the trees, it may, it may mean that jays are ganging up and chasing a raptor that they don't want in their territory. So look around if you hear a ruckus of birds, a cacophony of birds, as they say, um, look up toward the sound and see what you can find. Um, Blue jays have a particular fondness for acorns, so the many oak trees in the park um, attract them. And also take a, take a look at that crest on the head there. 
Um, the four birds that are around here with that dis a distinct crested head are the blue jay, it's the largest at 11 inches. Northern Cardinal that we just looked at, they're about nine inches long. Uh, cedar wax wings are seven and a quarter and black crested titmice have a, a crest. <laughs> it's in the name uh, and they're about six and a half inches. And we'll talk about all those birds before we're done here today. Here's a hermit thrush. I love this, I like this picture because it's like he's really checking me out as much as I'm checking him out. Um, they breed mostly in the Western part of the US and in Canada, but they spend the winters with us. Um, it's a grayish overall with a reddish tail and with that kind of smudged spotting on the breast. And um, at first I thought this fo photo was out of focus. It may be in other parts, but this smudging is in focus. It's just real smudgy. Um, the hermit thrush is, although it occasionally pops up into trees like this one did, it spends most of its time in the dense understory foraging on the ground. And they eat mainly insects, but um, often in the winter, they vary their diet to include wild berries. Spotted towhee. This is one of the prettiest birds I think around. You can see it, it's a, it's a pretty well camouflaged. There's the head, the eye, the beak. Tail goes way back here, rusty color, spots. Really a neat, a kind of a neat looking bird. Um, it spends most of its time down in the leaf litter under the trees. Uh, and then sometimes it jumps up. And this one actually jumped up and hopped along a fence at the Wildscape Demonstration Garden and, and then went over into this, this tree and uh, stayed there long enough so I could get a shot at it, a photograph of it. Um, the rufous and black coloration blends in nicely with the leaves. So if you're walking along and look, uh, look down at any rustling noise that you might hear and you might see this, this bird moving around. Um, um, if you're there's also an Eastern towhee and we are right on the Western edge of its winter range. So occasionally we'll see an Eastern towhee here. I don't have a picture of that, but it's a mostly black bird with just a few patches of white on the back and wings. None of, this, none of these spots like uh, the spotted towhee. This is a cute guy, little Verdon. Uh, it's about the size of a Carolina chickadee and it has that yellow face right here, right? And, and this is, a, a, if the light is right, this is like a bright golden yellow right in the face. <clears throat> and it also has a little red spot that's not visible here. The little red spot is um, on the very front of the wing. You can't see it in this picture. I think you might be able to see it except that that branch is in the way. Um, they're most often seen in the southern part of Bayer County in the thorny South Texas scrub areas, but we do get them at Hardberger Park occasionally. Um, and uh, I've seen a bird in nest at the Land Heritage Institute on the far south, south side of San Antonio. The nest is typically a ball-shaped mass of thorny sticks on the outside, and it's lined with grasses and feathers and plant fibers, et cetera. Now we're gonna talk about the two wrens that we commonly see at the park. This is the Carolina wren. It's deep, rusty, reddish, brownish, with buffy colored breast. Um, it's a prolific singer, as is the other wren. Um, and um, the, the songs carry a long way for such a small bird. You think you're gonna see this giant bird, but it turns out to be a little wren. Um, most, many people have trouble distinguishing between this a Carolina wren and the other wren, which is a Buick's wren. I'll show you that one in a second. Uh, Buick is B-E-W-I-C-K. Um, and uh, the rusty color of the Carolina versus the gray overall color of the Buicks is probably the easiest way to tell the species apart. Also, take a look at the length of this Carolina wren's tail. It's got a nice little tail. In relationship to its body though, it's not real long. Now we're gonna look at the Buicks wren. And you can see that it's more grayish. It doesn't have that deep rusty color uh, that the Carolina wren ha has. Uh, um, but that tail 
is notably longer in proportion to its body uh, than the Carolinas is. These two wrens often inhabit the same small area. And in fact, in our backyard, which is only two or three or four miles from the park, um, they don't seem to be territorial with each other at all. And in fact, they, they some, we've had sometimes both of them nesting in our back, both species nesting in our backyard. And now we have uh, three woodpeckers that we routinely see in the park. And this is the golden fronted woodpecker. It's a male. It's at the bird water feature, getting a drink. Um, it's nine and a half inches long. So it's the longest woodpecker that we see in uh, Bear County. And it, it's stunningly colorful. It has that laddering on the back, that barring on the back, a, a bright gold head there, and then a nice red spot on the front of the head. It's with us, uh, oh yeah, it's, it's with us year round and it nests here. Uh, it may be called golden fronted, but what you, where you really see the gold, the bright gold is on that head and the nape of the neck. Um, it's usually seen with, it, with its head up, but it was, yeah, actually I took this, we took, Alan took this picture now that I think about it. Alan took this picture to show them drinking there, um, but it was, it was unusually bent over to hold itself on that ledge and catch a drop or two of water. But, but you can notice here that it's using its tail to kind of balance itself. And that is very characteristic of woodpeckers. That tail is like another appendage really that helps them steady themselves in sort of odd configurations. Um, the bird's range includes most of the middle section of Texas. If you have friends that come in from other parts of the United States, they're in awe of the golden fronted woodpecker because you don't get to see it very many places. Here's a ladder backed woodpecker. Um, this is a female. She does not have the red on the nape of the neck and part of the top of the head that the male has. Um, and once again, this laddering and up, up, you know, you might hear them pecking in the tree, but it sometimes it's really hard to uh, see these birds because they're so well disguised uh, 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 there with the bark and their coloration. Um, the ladderbacked uh, woodpecker, the range is the southern section of the southwest part of the United States. Downy woodpecker, six and three quarter inches long. This is a little guy. It's uh, only a little bit uh, smaller than the ladderbacked, but uh, um, it's, it's so close in size that sometimes it's, it's hard to tell them apart by size. The best way is to know that this downy woodpecker has this white stripe or patch on the back, whereas the ladderback woodpecker just has the horizontal black and white barring all up and down the back. And I took this picture at, at a Sikius, uh Park uh, on the south side along the mission reach of the San Antonio River a, a month and a half or so ago. And uh, he was finding, this bird was finding some kind of really good grub in this hole in uh, what was a native pecan tree there. Black chinned hummingbird. Uh, this is a male and this is at the Wildscape Demonstration Garden. This is our most common uh, hummingbird in the summer. Um, other hummingbirds, including the ruby-throated hummingbird, winter here but head north in the spring to mate, leaving us with a black chinned, um, which sometimes stays uh, in the summer here. Unless the light hits the, uh, it's, it's here in the summer, it sometimes stays the winter here too is what I wanted to say. Unless the light hits the chin just right, and it's doing it just right here, this looks black, this throat or chin looks black. But as you can see, when the sun hits it just right, it's an iridescent purple. It's, it's a beautiful color. And this bird was coming into the nectar, to, it was coming in to get some nectar from the red yucca plant there at the Wildscape Demonstration Garden. There's a Carolina chickadee. It's the chickadee that we see in the south half of the eastern part of the United States. It looks a lot like a black chat black capped chickadee that's to the north of us, but they really are a, a whole separate species. Um, they have subtle coloration differences too. 
as well as the Carolina Chickadee's song is slightly higher, slightly higher pitch and a little slower than the Black Pat. But that's kind of a subtle difference to me too. So when all is said and done, just know that if you see a chickadee here in San Antonio, it's almost definitely going to be a Carolina chickadee. It's just what we have. Black Crested Titmouse. This bird can be seen in Texas and, um, and into northeastern Mexico. At one time, it was thought to be a subspecies of the tufted titmouse, which is in the eastern part of the United States, but since then it's been declared a whole separate species. The main difference in appearance is that the crest of the black crested is black, surprisingly. For once, a bird is actually named for what it looks like. And the gray color, uh, uh, the tufted titmouse has a, a, it's a dark gray, but it's not black. And you'll also often see Carolina chickadees and black crested uh, titmice uh, hanging out in mixed groups uh, because I'm guessing they probably like to eat the same things, um, the same, maybe the same small insects or the insects that they eat have a common habitat also. Um, both species eat both insects and seeds. <sighs> we often see them in the ball moss in our live oak trees. Uh, finding insects so small that we probably wouldn't have seen them with our eyes. And by the way, I have to say a word about ball moss. Uh, this, this little, there's a little piece of ball moss right here. And I got I to gotta talk about that just a second. It is an epiphyte, so it does not hurt its host, which is the tree, um, unless it covers so much of the tree that no light can get into the leaves. Um, that ball moss is really a great food it's a great food source for not only chickadees and titmice, but also for migrating warblers in the spring and fall as they come through our area. So I encourage you to uh, leave the ball moss on your trees. Lesser goldfinch. We have two goldfinches here in San Antonio. The lesser goldfinch is our smaller, slightly smaller goldfinch, and it, and it stays with us year round. This one does. The adult males have this striking dark back and a bright yellow breast, really a bright yellow breast. And when they fly, uh, they have a large white patch below the wing bars. It's, I think you'll see it here on the wing bar right here. Um, and so when you're looking at it from below, while you're watching it fly, you see that white patch below the wing bars. Um, and this lesser goldfinch was eating the seed from the mealy blue sage in the butterfly-shaped raised bed located in front of the outdoor educational building on the Blanco entrance side of the park. American goldfinch. It's starting to come out of its winter plumage. It is here with us only in the winter. Um, and in the winter, it's kind of dull looking. Um, uh, with, so it's actually a little bit challenging to tell the difference between the American goldfinch um, and the lesser goldfinch females. They look a lot of like. Um, right before they migrate to the north to their breeding grounds, the American goldfinch males begin to brighten up into a bright yellow color with a black cap and black wings. And you can see the black wings here and you can see the beginning of this black. You can see it's getting some of the feathers already for that black cap. Just when they're the prettiest, boom, they're gone. They fly north to breed, and then they come back to see us the next winter. Uh, both of the goldfinches are truly seed eaters and are fairly easy to attract to your backyard bird feeders with fresh thistle or niger seed. They love that high oil seed. In the wild, they eat many different kinds of seeds, but um, if there are thistle plants around that have gone to seed, Watch for goldfinches because they're likely to be around in good numbers uh, at that point chowing down on the seed. Chipping sparrow. Um, some birders fondly call them chippies. Um, they are generally seen here only in the winter and they breed uh, quite a bit farther north. The rusty colored head of our non-breeding chickadee is not quite as colorful as it is in the breeding areas in the spring. It'll be redder and uh, darker there. Uh, they often are difficult, to, sparrows, winter sparrows are often difficult to identify, but if you see one that has this dark stripe that goes from the back of the beak 
all the way back to the back of the head and goes through the eye, it's likely to be a chipping sparrow. Vesper sparrow is uh, another one of our winter visitors. It has a, a brown streaked breast, as you can see here, and a white eye ring so that you can clearly see in the photo. And when it flies, you see flashes of white on both sides of the tail. And that means that it has a solid white feather on either side of the tail. But those characteristics help lead you to believe that it's a Vesper Sparrow. Here's a loggerhead shrike. Um, this loggerhead shrike eats insects, but it also eats small birds, lizards, and small mammals. Um, sometimes people call it the butcher bird because it often skewers its prey on thorns or barbed wire. And uh, that makes the food easier to eat. It stays still, it doesn't wiggle away. And um, sometimes they seem to store their food there if they're, uh, and they'll come back later when they're hungry again. You frequently see loggerhead shrikes sitting atop the tallest tree, like in this photo. And they're up there to get a good view of uh, what food might be in their territory. Uh, the most distinctive aspect of the loggerhead shrike's appearance is this black mask right here. You see that very well in this photo. The northern mockingbird. As you may know, the northern mockingbird is our Texas state bird. It's also the state bird uh, for four other states in the southern part of the U.S. We do see juveniles here in the park, and which is a good sign. And it generally means that they've been successfully nesting in Hardburger Park. I got another Northern Mockingbird photo. Um, it was eating the last of the red berries on the flame leaf sumac in the Wildscape Demonstration Garden just a couple of months ago. Um, in the winter, berries are its main food source. Um, and I've seen them eating berries from beauty bushes and hackberry trees, etc. Here's a scissor tail fly catcher. Um, it's with us only during the breeding season. Uh, it's fairly readily identified because of its long, deep, uh, deeply forked tail. The body of uh, the bird itself is uh, smaller than a robin, but it seems much larger because of the long tail. Ruby-crowned kinglet. This is a very small bird that flits around in the trees and shrubs, flutters around uh, searching for spiders and gnats. Um, and I'm going to show you, a, it really moves fast. It's very hard to get a photo of and I got to show you this because this is how my photos usually turn out of ruby crown kinglets. It's on its way out of the picture right there. It's a great shot of its rear end. Okay, here's a white-eyed vireo. This is another bird that's aptly named. It, that white eye is, very, is a very distinctive feature. This particular one is a juvenile so it's still outgrowing its um, downy feathers. It feeds in the ball moss, once again, probably getting some good bugs. Sometimes there are seeds in there too. Summer tanager male. Uh, unlike many migrating birds that spend the winter with us only or just fly through during migration, summer tanagers actually join us in the spring for their mating season. Kind of looks like a northern cardinal, but it doesn't have the crest. And it's a slightly different color, kind of a strawberry color. The female tanager is sort of a mustardy yellow and it makes the bird uh, a little more challenging to that bird, the female, to, to find in the trees because it looks like the leaves. They eat wasps and bees that they glean from the leaves. And here's a juvenile male. Uh, we've had them coming to our feeders now. They come to the suet for some um, protein, some, some good high fat protein. And this one is a male, it, it'll, it'll get that fully, full red color after a bit. Black and white warblers, um, it's the only warbler we see that's black and white. Um, the, the maps say that it's not here in the winter, but that's, um, that's not entirely right because they are here in the winter. A few of them stay for the winter. And um, yellow rumped warbler at the water bird feature. Uh, you can kind of see the yellow spot under the wings and the yellow spot at the rump. Therefore, it's called the yellow rumped warbler. People often call it very fondly a butter butt. Um, this winter we saw 
probably 15, 20 in those pecan trees at Osequia uh, Park along the Mission Reach of San Antonio. Here's an orange crown warbler. It's, it, it's described as a drab plumage, but it has a little uh, yellow under the, under the tail, under the bottom of the base of the tail. And you can almost see some black um, striping on the breast, almost, not quite. The orange crown is usually not visible, but I'm gonna show a picture to you. This was an orange crown warbler bathing in our bird bath. You can see the orange, you can see the striping that's almost invisible otherwise. You can see that bright under, that bright yellow under. Um, it looks, it, you can't, um, you can't mistake this, but it sure doesn't look like an orange crown that's dry. And here's a yellow-throated warbler. Um, this is the bird that Alan was saying was first recorded at Phil Hardberger Park last year. He saw it close to the bird water feature. It was just coming through in migration. Um, birds need the water, and it was uh, especially during migration uh, when and it was a dry period. There weren't a lot of little ponds of water around. So that bird water feature comes in really handy when we're in a drought situation. The migrating birds will find it. And this is a golden cheek warbler. Uh, several years ago, very near the outdoor classroom, <clears throat> on the Blanco side entrance, Wendy Leonard spied a golden cheeked warbler in migration. She was the park naturalist at the time, and now she's the, a park, a nature preserve officer for San Antonio Parks and Rec. This bird, this species is rare and endangered. All of the golden cheeked warblers <coughs> breed in the hill country. So this one was probably on its way to its breeding place uh, wherever it was in the hill country, but we do have them uh, breed as close into town as Eisenhower Park and, and Camp Bullis. Then real quickly, morning dove. We got a couple of doves here. This is the morning dove. Uh, this one followed us around uh, in the garden looking for um, seeds that had come off of uh, uh, our spring wildflowers. Uh, this one you can see has spots and um, it has a longer tail in proportion to its oh. body. And the, and the tail, the tail is, um, if you could see it, it's, uh, it's got a point on the end. This is a white winged dove. This is a, um, a game dove, a game bird. And so you might know people who, um, who uh, do hunt for them. Uh, it has this patch on the wing. It has a white wing. And one more, one more photo. The Greater Roadrunner. This is one of my favorite birds and it is one of my favorite photos. It was in the Wildscape Demonstration Garden uh, last spring uh, demonstrating mating behavior. He was prancing around like crazy outside of the metal fence. And I couldn't, he had a lizard in his mouth. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. Was he struggling with the lizard? What's happening? And then all of a sudden the female came running out from inside the metal fence. And then I figured out what was going on. He was trying to show her that he was a good provider. So um, um, our garden, well, actually all of Phil Harbor Park is a really good HEB or food source for roadrunners. Our garden had a lot of lizards last year. So now I will, um, let's see, you've heard Alan's part of the program about tools and uh, the photos here that I have had of some, mostly of the more common birds, but also a few of the less common. So I'm gonna switch out of screen sharing for a second, and then I'm gonna go back into it so I can show you our resource page that we were talking about. And um, in the chat, I noticed that uh, Catherine uh, mentioned where you'd be able to find it later if you wanna look at it. So. Um, now, I think you've got some good information, hopefully some good information about birds of Hardberger in the area, and you'll have an opportunity to do further research where you're interested in doing so. So I'm going to leave this page on for a minute or two if you want to make a, a note of anything uh, or take a picture of it, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get off of it. But in the meantime, um, we're glad that you came. And I hope that you will be able to join us sometime when we're able to do uh, bird walks again at Hardberger Park in person, that we don't have to Zoom everything, although this is a good way to learn too. Um, and we'll try to answer any questions that have come up in the chat for, from viewers. So Catherine, if you'd help us out, if you've got any questions, we'd be glad to try to take them.
Absolutely. So we've had some questions that have come up. Um, and if you have any more, go ahead and put them in the chat now. So um, one comment, Jim um, Berbiglia said, I have an Audubon's Oriole now, Sarantia Lotus. And nice. Mary Sides asked, what's the best time of day to go birding? Well, I'll take that one if you don't, if that's okay, Ellen. Um, yeah. uh, there's controversy in our household as the best time of the day. I'm not an early riser, so it's unlikely you're going to see me any place at sunrise unless it's really important. But truthfully, the earliest part of the day is the better. I have never been convinced that I was going to see a whole lot more birds at 8.30 than at 7 o'clock in the morning, however, because as I say, I'm not a really good early riser. Um, my body might be there, but my brain doesn't engage until a little later. So um, uh, morning is best though, early morning is best. Uh, birds seem to eat early and then take a break. They, uh, they don't need to eat, most birds don't need to eat all day long constantly, so they go take a break. Um, Alan, what would you say about that? Yeah, that's true. It's, it's, be it's better early in the morning and uh... And uh, you're right, we have a little bit of disagreement, but not so much as we used to. Because <laughs> he likes to sleep in now too. <laughs> okay, that's the answer to that question as far as we are concerned. <laughs> um, Wendy Jezik asked, uh, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation here. Do we have Perluxia? We saw a turkey in the snow last week. I'll take this one. Uh, the Paraluxia have not been seen yet in uh, in uh, the park. Uh, I, I just checked the species map on eBird to confirm that. Uh, they have been seen within the last month at uh, a couple of spots in, in Bear County. So it's very possible we'll get them, but we haven't yet. And it's more likely to see them in the south part of Bear County uh, at, at this point. Uh, they may be moving farther to the north, but usually you'll see them in, in the kind of the, the South Texas scrub area uh, in the southern, far southern part of, of Bear County. We saw some uh, at the Land Heritage Institute in South Bear County fairly recently. Christopher Merriweather asks, what camera do you use? Well, I, we use, actually we both use the same camera now, don't we? Um, the Panasonic, let me see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to undo the screen, stop, stop my share so I can sh show you. It's just a little guy. Uh-oh, can't see it with my background. Alan, is yours handy? No. Oh, okay. oh yeah. It's a Panasonic uh, DMC-ZS60. Um, it's it's not a cheap camera, but it's not an expensive camera as cameras go. Here, maybe you can see. I got it. I got it. I found a place where you could see it. And um, when I turn it on, it's just got a just got a short telescope. This is a pretty good camera. It's certainly not for professionals, but um, all of the pictures that were in the slideshow of mine were taken with this camera. So it takes a pretty darn. It takes. It's as good as I need. So we've got lots and lots of thank yous and I enjoyed this, wonderful pictures. Um, El Evelyn Penrod asks, does an owl return to her previous nest and build a new one each year or build a new one each year? Well, I just read about the Eastern Screech Owl and when they have a nest outside of, outside of a cavity, um, they usually use somebody else's nest. Uh, a nest that some other big bird uh, has used before. And then that's usually the last time that that nest is used. It may make it one more season for a, for a second nest uh, for the owl, great horned owl, but usually it's that, that nest is toward the end of its lifespan. And um, I think for cavity uh, nesters, they do use the same nest over and over again, typically. What do you think, Bunny? Alan? The, like you said, the, uh, 
the owls use nests from other birds. The horned owl that you had on Salado Creek was use it, use the nest of a of a uh, of a hawk that was already there. Uh, I don't think they came back, so I don't. They may or may not come back to the same nest. Right. So lots and lots more thank yous. Um, Sharon Fisher comments, thank you. I saw a few birds I haven't witnessed before in my yard, so I'll look for them now. Recently, I've had many seeding, or sorry, cedar waxwing flocks, including this morning. Good. Well, also, uh, in addition to more than usual of the cedar waxwings, we're getting a lot of reports of pine siskins. They kind of look like um, um, goldfinches and are often mistaken for goldfinches but uh, they have striping on the breast. So if you see what you think is a goldfinch with striping, take a look at it. It's, it might be a pine siskin. This winter, we're getting a lot of them and you'll see them in good sized groups at feeders. I just had a dozen uh, at our feeder yesterday, I think. Linda K. Bush says, thank you for this most informative presentation. It has been very useful to a beginner like myself. Right. Good. Jan Kemp comments. Can you please say the name of the camera again? Sure. It is. Actually, I should, I should have said the name. It's up, on the front of it. It says Lumix, L-U-M-I-X. And then on the bottom of it, it says Panasonic. And the model number is DMC hyphen ZS60. All right. A few more questions. Someone asks, any sightings of robins in San Antonio? <laughs> Big year for robins, too. Big year for robins. Uh, we've had a lot at our, uh, we've had a number of them at our house. Uh, and when we're out on walks, we're seeing a lot of them, a lot of them this year, this time of year. Great. More than, um, more, many, many more than usual. Many more than usual. Okay. Um, Key asks, what kind of bird seed do you have in your backyard? We, we have a couple of kinds. We have the Niger seed uh, that Patsy mentioned primarily for the uh, goldfinches. We also have a, a no mess mixture from uh, the wild bird store that is basically the kernels of, of a number of seeds. And then we have some black sunflower seed. We also have a, uh, a piece of fake suet in there, the suet cakes that you can buy at the bird stores. And interestingly, I will note that when we bought some suet cakes that had mealworms in them, it seems to me, and I wish I had kept better track of it, but it seems to me that once it put the, once it, we got some with worms in it, that's when we started see, seeing summer tanagers at our feeders. I could be wrong. But that seems right. So if that's all the questions, then thank you so much for joining us for this talk. If you're interested in learning more about Hardberger Park and the Conservancy that supports it, please visit philhardbergerpark.org. The Conservancy is a member-based nonprofit that relies on donations to support educational activities in the park. If you're able to give five or $10 to support programs like today's, we would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Goodbye, thank you. Thank Bye, you, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>